see you here. Um, we're very happy to present for you tonight uh, Michael Levine. Um, Mr. Levine has been an undercover agent for 25 years uh, fighting drug traffic throughout the world. He's worked for the DEA for 17 of those years. Um, in the process, he discovered that not all, um, not everyone involved in the drug war is really out to stop drugs. He's a man right now who is trying to escape some of the bizarre aspects of life. He's going to tell you a lot of stories tonight, some of which are rather bizarre. Unfortunately, they are also true. Um, this will be, I'm sure they'll be interesting as well. And therefore, I will turn over the podium now to Michael Levine. Thank you. Bizarre is a guy like me who spent 25 years lying to people, telling them I was everything from a professional hairdresser to an American Nazi. I lived in the American Nazi party for a couple of months. And now I'm standing up in front of an audience telling you the truth. That's a bizarre experience, one I'll never get over. I got a flashback to 19, the early 70s. The first time I spoke to a college audience. DEA, in those years, was having a hard time getting uh, agents to go out to colleges and speak to them. Why? Because during Vietnam, in those years, people didn't trust their government. And the least trustful thing that there was was a norm. An undercover norm. There was nothing more hated than an undercover norm. And to the norms, what college audiences represented were pinkos, communists. You know why? Because they were demonstrating against an unjust war. And we, we norms, we believed in anybody that spoke against their government. Had to be in comedy. Impossible. Like, I was also kind of a strange kid. I in the South Bronx, afraid of everything, afraid of dogs. But I had this way of combating my own fears, and that was by facing the director. So when I joined the military, I became a dog trainer, sentry dog camp. And early on in life, Yeah, 
head. You are in him. See, now in the word. And all I'm thinking is, jump, jump, jump. I gotta think of the jump. It's almost like the one with the farmer and the two sails. Oh, God, oh, God. It comes to me. And I said the following, this is actually happening. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Special Agent Michael Levine, I'm an undercover narcotic agent. And it's my duty to inform you that before the government allows me to speak before any audience, you all have to be searched. My partner, Special Agent Garcia, will now stand up. I want you all to stand and empty your pockets. <laughs> and at that moment, there was a dead silence, and it was deep and a mass rush for one door. <laughs> 300 people running for one door. Two people were hospitalized, and all I was saying was, it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. One guy just went catatonic and never moved. <laughs> I don't tell jokes anymore. Matter of fact, really what I'm going to talk about isn't funny. Uh, I'm not going to convince any, I'm going to try to convince any of you about anything. Uh, DEA in 1986, the New York Times article called me one of their top undercover experts. The one thing I do well was making drug cases. Spent 25 years testifying in courts, piling information, making drug cases. Never lose If there's anything I'm expert at, observing, remembering, and telling in front of a court, and you can consider yourself a court now, what I saw and what I observed. That's what I'm going to tell you. You can make your own mind up about things. I don't, I'm not going to be able to convince anybody of anything, but the one thing you have to believe is that I'm now doing what I did best. Talk about undercover drug war. What an undercover agent does, I spent 17 years of, of my career teaching what I was doing. Just teaching guys to stay alive. Stay alive like in New York. There's no death penalty. You've got a governor that will not vote for a death penalty. But there's life in prison for possession of more than three ounces of white powder. Life in prison. What happens? Friend of mine, Eric Hatcher, goes out undercover to buy a couple of ounces of dope from a guy named Gus Palachi. Think about undercover in situations like that, in most situations, is that you're literally acting for your life. You're acting for your damn life. And I try to drum, to this day, I still teach narcotic undercover for a private company for local police, and all I want to do is teach these guys how to stay alive. They're getting killed every day. Now, if it was undercover with this Farachi, Farachi had just been let out of jail. <coughs> Farachi uh, was a racist, he hated black people. Nobody told him that was a black undercover agent. Farachi had just served eight years to killing a black man. Now, there was a flaw in every act. We don't know exactly what that flaw was. But Farachi, in one given moment, suspected that Everett was either the man, an undercover now, or an informant. In his jail, streetwise mind, he quickly calculated that he can get no more time for killing Everett than he could have ever arrested him for drugs. So, there was an undercover meeting place out in Staten Island. Farachi walked over to his cousin in a car and said, I think the guy is either the man or not. I'm going to do him. Without another word, he took the gun, walked back, and shot Everett twice in the head. A couple of ounces of power. Chris Hoban, New York City detective, 24 years old. He was the same age. My son is a police sergeant in New York City. They were both the same age. And uh, Chris Hoban was undercover buying a couple of grams, grams of white powder. Grams, hardly anything. The 
drug dealer saw something. There was a flaw in his act. A flaw in his act. Drug dealer said, try it. Try it and Now, in the New York City Police Department, there are tons of regulations, like in the Drug Enforcement Administration and other police departments around the country. Regulations that are there to protect the bureaucracy, to protect the image of the bureaucrats. And among those regulations was one that said if a New York City policeman ingests any amount of drugs, he could be fired. Well, Chris Hartman hesitated because he thought of his job. The guy didn't hesitate, he put a bullet in his brain. 24 years. He died. Now, in both cases, oh, there are many of them. That's just two uh, Another cop died in New York on uh, the same day that Chris Hogan did. Both cases had one thing in common, as all the drug agents who are killed in the line of duty have in common. And that is, at the funeral, what you saw were politicians, bureaucrats, the senators, and the, the heads of agencies, and the chief, the suits, I call them, the suits and the politicians. And they stood there and faced cameras. And they said to you, to you people, you Americans, you taxpayers, they said to all of you, they said that these men died for a just cause. They died for a just cause. They died saving your children. I'm here to tell you that they lied. They lied. You can't, you don't know how bad they lied. You have to understand, I have to tell you a little bit about my background so you understand where I'm coming from, how I became a narcotic agent. I, I told you I grew up in the South Bronx. I was a very bad kid, very bad kid. Violent. In the street gang days of the 50s. Of course, the street gang days of the 50s compared to the street gangs now was sort of like Ozzy and Harry compared to the boys in the hood. You know, we thought people were bad. Well, I was bad enough to be arrested twice as a juvenile delinquent. That finally did it. Drink a lot of wine. My brother, of course, at that point, we didn't know it. My brother had already started on heroin. Uh, I was into Thunderbird wine, trying to shake myself out. All I wanted, to, all I knew was I wanted to be something. I wanted to just be something. I didn't know what you want to be. In the movies, in the movies, I saw Tony Curtis, I think, and he was an airline pilot, and he had airline stewardesses all over the world. Oh, yeah, in my Thunderbird hey, that's what I want to be. And I went down to the uh, recruiter, and of course, most years of recruiters, they had a, a quota. They'll tell you anything. Kind of like a job. And uh, I said, what do you want to be? I just the kind of guy we're looking for. Human out the wind, wind off. We're going to put a couple of million dollars of aircraft in your hand. Signed right here, signed away four years of my life. That drunken afternoon, of course, I'm drinking all the way up until uh, they, they inducted me. For the first time in my life, future pilot Michael Green stood in front of an airplane. I've never been near an airplane. And a kid from New York, he, he measured, you know, he had an army, he measured things. I'm, I'm looking at this, and this would be four jets. So you have all the ice and things. Four engine prop job, and I'm going to fly from New York to San Antonio, Texas. And I'm standing on the ground looking at it. And by my rule of thumb, it weighed like 11 garbage trucks. <laughs> and I couldn't figure how anything that weighed 11 garbage trucks could get off the ground and stay off the ground from New York to Texas. It was not, I never got over that fear. To this day, I'm one of these guys that is so terrified on a plane that. I eat all the airplane food, you know, right down to the plastic cups and the shit there. But the government recognized that. They put me in what? Military police. In yeah, military police, and then of course, a sentry dog came. Had I overcome my fear of dogs. But I was still a fighting crazy young guy. So I joined uh, a class for the Air Force Base. The first event that walked my life or turned my life to where I am today was starting to unravel. Uh, I joined the Plattsburgh Air Force Base boxing team. 
trying to get this violence out of my system. Made me worse. Uh, got in a fight with a guy. Got in an argument with a guy first. Over three hours and a half. Both the police. I was seconds away from my whole life changing. In the middle of this verbal argument, man pulled a 45, stuck in my stomach, and pulled the trigger. And I guess you'll hear that clip now. The air police came, we both air police, people took the gun away from the guy, uh, he was arrested, we were brought down, there were two witnesses, everyone was brought down. The gun was test fired and kept firing every time after that. They showed me the bullet. The bullet had been struck precisely the way the bullet should be struck to go off. Now, just almost prophetically, two weeks before that, one of, one of my guys, and one of my buddies in, in the essentially uh, adult section had been playing with a 45, just hitting it against his leg, and it went off and blew his leg off. 45 is a big, mean bullet, and this gun was well, it was close enough where he was able to slap me, then pull the gun and shoot me. That's how close that gun was. And that moment on, I started to change. You know, the Arabs have a saying. Any day is a good day to die. And I had that lesson ran home for me in that one minute how it quit. What I evolved out of that was a, was a young man that wanted to experience everything in life. Everything. I couldn't live fast enough. I wanted to go everywhere. I wanted to do it. I wanted to taste it. I wanted to feel it. I wanted to go to every country. I wanted to go to bed with every woman. I wanted to try everything. And I just, because I knew, I learned, as Martin Luther King said, I had been to the mountain that day. And I understood something that has traveled with me through my life and now. Well, how? We cut to a few years later, and now I found myself, this man hungry to live, graduated from Hofstra University, married, obeying the other way, with a degree in accounting. Wondering how this happened. Second event that, again, turned me, turned another point of me, aiming me at this career hunger of a life. Running to a guy on Hofstra University campus, he has a pamphlet in his pocket. In the pamphlet is a, on the pamphlet is a picture of a James Bond looking guy getting off a plane and it says, Be a tea man, you're a treasury agent. I look at it, within a week I'm taking a test. Incredibly, months later, I'm working for in, the Internal Revenue Intelligence Division. Wearing a little hat, riding around in a Brand new car convertible, spending your money betting with bookmakers. I went to a bookmaker, bet a few dollars, go to the next bookmaker, bet a few dollars. Behind me are a bunch of guys named Bernie who run in and arrest the guy for gambling without a wagering tax man. That was your organized OCD, organized crime job. And every day you see in the newspapers another blow multi-billion dollar gambling organization closed down. It was the beginning of an education about how the public is told one thing and reality is another world. So for a year I'm watching the public being told how I'm closing down multi-million, hundred million dollar gambling organizations where I bet maybe 15 or 20 dollars in a three day period. And I'm thinking, this is incomplete. If I was saved, it had to be for something. It had to be for some real reason. If I'm, I should be dead. If I was saved, if there's any reality to this world, if there's any logic to it, me being saved had to be for some purpose other than riding around with a hat, but in the bookmakers. Then my mom called me, it was uh, 1966. She had found something in my, my brother's room, and her house was about uh, half a mile. I was over her house, and uh, came up the stairs.
upstairs at one o'clock, she told me the box, the appears in her eyes, and in this box, I, she had a hypodermic needle, a couple of bags of white powder, that got spoon, it was my baby brother's box. There was nothing new, there was nothing we could say. This was our first discovery that my brother was a heroin addict. We waited all night. He showed up about 4 o'clock in the morning, and he saw us. He knew that we knew. And we knew, again, nothing to say. What do you say? My experience at that point was anyone who saw on heroin was dead. I didn't know anybody who survived. In one way or another, he died. Nobody survived. That was my frame of reference from the streets of the South Bronx to being an agent for the government. He was dead. And I looked at my brother and I said, Yeah, I, I love you, but I'm, I'm looking at a dead man. And he, of course, he promised. He was going to go straight, he was going to go to programs, and he went into the first Phoenix House program. That was the beginning of 19 years of uh, heroin addiction. When he had already been an addict, and somehow I hid it for almost five years up to that point. But that was the beginning of a, a long battle with my family following what all the experts say. But what was the beginning for me was a direction in life. From that moment on, I became a kamikaze in this drug war. I believe, I believe in what the politicians and the, the bureaucrats say, that it is those bastards' fault that my brother is on drugs. Them sending drugs to this country is their fault. And I felt there is nothing that I wouldn't do to win. This is a war. You understand that a war, whatever you do is okay. It's, it's legal. It doesn't matter. They're hurt, they're trying to kill us. We can do anything. Of course, I began, I, I, I switched to the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms. They had a, a law then, a federal crime committed while carrying a firearm. I used it as my own personal hunting license for drug dealers. I started going out and setting up drug dealers after drug dealer, ordering guns and dope, and shoveling them into jail like they were coming out of style. A guy, by the, by the time uh, I hit 1977, I had put something like 3,000 people away. In fact, an Englishman by the name of Donald Gotti later wrote a book about it called Undercut. I couldn't have been more of a comic <coughs> I was just completely gone. Well, 1971, I switched into the hard narcotic smuggling group of customers. That by the name, July 4th, 1971, began my first episode in overseas undercover work. What in the Bible? July 4th, 1971, that was named John Davis and was arrested with three kilos of heroin coming into John F. Kennedy Airport. John Davis had made seven trips. He was an ex-GI from Vietnam who had made his connections to Bangkok, Thailand, and began smuggling heroin. Seven trips in one year, 21 kilos of heroin. The, the heroin cost him about 2,500 kilos, which is uh, 40, 40 ounces. He would sell it for 40 ounces in the States for roughly anywhere from two to $6,000 an ounce. So he was turning over an immense profit, millions of dollars a year. His financier was a, uh, a senior at Miami University. In one operation, we managed to lock everybody up. And I asked John Dickinson, where do you get this stuff? And he told me, these Chinese people in Bangkok, Thailand. I said, well, can you send me there? Can you send me there? He said, well, this is what we have to do. We have to take a photograph of you and I friends. Send the answer to them, and I'll tell them I'm hot here, but I want to send my partner Mike. Now I ask my boss, can I do that? Can I go to Bangkok and buy and buy? It's never been done. Can I go to Bangkok and buy from this guy's connection? What else he tells me is that these people were doing, he had been to their factory in a place called Chiang Mai, brought in Thailand. And at Chiang Mai, in Chiang Mai, he had seen them producing hundreds of people of heroin. This is my chance to go to the heart of the enemy. Well, we sent the photo. My boss, one of the best uh, enforcement bosses in, in drug enforcement, was a guy named Al Seal. He says, you want to do it again? Yeah, I want to do it. I'll do anything to do it. Go ahead. Not knowing what I was getting into, the photo goes, within a month, I get an answer back. Come. Come from this drug dealer. People doing hundreds of kilos. But I didn't know. 
point was that this case dovetailed. There was another case called the Herman Jackson case. Let's tell you about this Herman Jackson case. GIs in Vietnam wound up buying businesses in Bangkok, Thailand, making dope connections, keeping their friends, their connections in Graves Registration. Graves Registration is where GIs were being killed. And God knows there was enough GIs being killed. They're registered, sent to Bangkok, Thailand, where they are transshipped to the U.S. for burial. What this organization was doing was, you probably guessed it by now, they were sending the bodies to Bangkok, putting heroin inside the bodies of our young GIs. Inside the body bags, inside the body cavities, filling them up with heroin. These young men, 19-year-old men, I was age, 19 years old, who had gone and, and, and given their life to this country, and their bodies were being used as conveyors of heroin. What I didn't know was that the source for heroin in both cases was the people that I was dealing with. Now I get to Bangkok, and I meet the drug dealers. That's how I hang out with them. And they love me. I was good at acting bad. I was good at being a bad guy and acting like a mafia chief or whatever. You name it, man. You do whatever kind of act you want. I would do anything, anything to get over. They liked me so much that they invited me to come to Chiang Mai, to the factory. Now, factories where they're producing hundreds of kilos. I allegedly came there to buy three kilos as a prelude to buying 50 and 100 kilo loads of heroin. It had never been done before. The biggest heroin shipment seized in this, at this year, 1971, was the French Connection. 66 kilos of heroin. Now, I'm getting, I'm getting the offer to go to Chiang Mai where they're producing hundreds of kilos a week. Unheard of. Suddenly, the case starts to go awry. Mysteriously. My case starts to go awry. Where I was supposed to get 6,500, which is the price of three kilos, suddenly I'm not getting authorization for the money. And as I'm making excuses, what I'm, I'm, I'm finding out is that these, these people, somebody in my government, is trying to hurt the case, but I don't know who it is. Now I find myself, I'm working undercover, I'm living in a hotel in Bangkok, the Siam Continental. Whenever the drug dealers aren't there, I'm taking 17 kids to get to the embassy and changing disguises. I have to keep fighting with bureaucrats. Give me the 6,500. What should I do? Fly it alone? I'm starting to look like a liar. I'm starting to look like a con man. The guy who sent me over to Davidson, he would show up and give them cash and the deal was done. Look what you're doing. You're destroying the case. You're destroying my chance to go right to the factory. What kind of drug war is this? And I'm fighting with bureaucrats. And, I, and, I, and every day that goes by and I don't get the authorization for the money, I'm lying more than money more than a lie. Finally I'm told, you're going to get money for one kilo and you're not going to Chiang Mai. But why? Doesn't make any sense. Why? There are other priorities. What are the priorities? What did he tell me? But he mentioned said that John is on number one priority. What are you telling me there's other priorities? There are other priorities. Well, you see, around if I had been a little more studious than I was, there was a book out called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia by a man named Charles McCoy that detailed how our CIA was protecting the biggest drug dealers in that area. Why? Because they were anti communists But I wouldn't read a book like that because you read a book like that. Yeah, they're people. Yeah, they're not going to write something like that. They can't be real. Who would put dope in the bodies of young men? And you tell me that an American agency would protect people like that? I can't be real. What's Charles McCoy's friend of mine now? And now I believe. Well, 
case was done. Again, I finally got twenty five hundred dollars. They delivered one kilo of heroin to me. They were arrested. Went no further than them. Didn't get anywhere near Chiang Mai. Came back to the states. Huge publicity. First time in history an entire drug ring was stopped. Victory in the drug war on drugs. We got the finance here. We got the source. Major connection between the U.S. It was the first big lie. But I couldn't believe it. I, I could not believe that I, this had to be an aberration. It's too much for me to absorb. I get back to the States and I went back in war. Back putting drug dealers in jail like a major. <laughs> 1977, I'm preaching out how to come to cover in front of uh, local district attorneys, investigators, and police. And the phone rings behind me and it's my ex wife. And she's crying and she said, David just killed himself. So. It's my brother. Just committed suicide. He left a note to my family and friends. I'm sorry, I just can't stand the drugs anymore. 1978, I'm transferred, transferred to Buenos Aires, Argentina. The same time I'm transferred to Buenos Aires, Argentina, there's an organization in Bayburn, Bolivia, neo Nazi, Klaus Barbie. Roberto Suarez. Los, uh, los novios de la muerte, the fiancés of death. These are people that are trying to control Bolivia. And I become obsessed. And this thing, I become totally obsessed with penetrating this organization. Knocking them down. They are the thieves. Of course, at the same time, it was uh, just to show you. By far, the Republican, the Democrats are in power now, as we call it. And uh, Peter Bourne, Peter Bourne uh, was Jimmy Carter's White House advisor, and uh, he decreed that cocaine was the, one, the most benign of illegal drugs, no problem whatsoever. Uh, the Carter kids, it was, was no drug problem. The Carter kids were smoking dope with Willie Nelson in the White House, everything was cool, you know. Meantime, the neo Nazi cocaine cartels were starting to form what eventually became the General Motors of Cocaine, La Corporación, General Motors of Cocaine. Now, what happened? Incredibly, I managed to penetrate them undercover, posing as a head Puerto Rican here, the Italian member of the mafia. I find myself kneeling face to face on a drug deal with a man named Marcelo Fontes. Roberto Suarez is a right hand man. This is now February of 1980. And what does he tell me? He says that we're trying to create an umbrella organization in Bolivia. Get all the drug exporting, all the drug manufacturers under one umbrella organization. Get rid of the competition. We're looking for big customers, customers that can take. Thousand kilos a month. Thousand kilos. At this time in our history, the biggest drug seizure was by a border patrolman, a casual car stop in Florida, 200 kilos of cocaine. Nobody knew those numbers existed. This guy wants to sell me a thousand kilos a month. Just saying the words for an undercover narcotic agent, a thousand kilos, <laughs> couldn't say it convincingly. So I said, I'll take 500. He almost walked away. You understand that the media was so far behind, they didn't know anything that they existed. I, put, I hustled to the embassy, get on a swivel phone, four media headquarters, and I say the name, Roberto Suarez. And one of the suits in media headquarters says, I want to check it in the computer. And he calls me back a half hour later and he says, he's not in the computer. He's not in the computer. I should have known. Then, of course, a few months later, Mike Wallace, in 60 minutes, all of you, he's the biggest drug dealer who ever lived. But he, he didn't have his name in a computer. Why? Why? Well, I go back and meet myself in five years. He, he, he doesn't know the credit as far as he's not in the computer. He still wants to sell me 500, at least 500 kilos of dope. 
All he wants is to see that I'm for real. He wants to see this mafia that I have in my hand. That I told him I have in my hand. And he'll deliver 500 people. Well, from this point on, a strange thing is starting to happen. My government starts making moves. Some of the moves, as well, like, in the book I don't think of, but some of it's there, but it's going to be in a book called Queen of Hope, eating step by step everything they do. And the same thing, I assure you, will happen as happened after the public sheet public. No one in the government is going to be able to read you one fact or one word and say. But I'm telling you, and your government then set out, your covert government then set out to destroy this case. If it weren't for the efforts of a handful of undercover agents who were like me and believed in this crap, who believed that it's for real, if it wasn't for, for this one group, we managed to lie to our bosses, to work around them, and this, by the way, uh, the suit to DEA, when I persisted in trying to work the Roberto Suarez case, accused me of trying to run a scam, trying to uh, set up this bogus undercover operation so that I could get a free trip to the States, uh, you name it. But what happened was, the man kept insisting on trying to sell me coke, they had set up this thing. Case this scam ended with me paying nine million dollars in Miami tax ball to a guy by the name of Jose Roberto Gaza and another man by the name of Alfredo Cucucci who killed us. They were up in the computer. Now, bang, Zippo, off Miami Herald International, New York Times, 60 Minutes, biggest drug scam in history, Penthouse Magazine, uh, the movie Scarface was modeled after this case. You were told about the biggest sting in history and what an incredible job your tax dollars were doing. You were told how I've numbered, how I've done, and how many your valiant forces in this war against the white death are, and how we need more of your money and more of your support. What you weren't told was that before I could get back to Argentina, Jose Roberto Casas was released from jail. His case wasn't even put before a grand jury. Who released him? Michael Pat Sullivan, the man now prosecuting Noriega. <laughs> when I, months later, Judge Austin Hastings mysteriously dropped the bail on Petrucci Gutierrez from $3 million to $1 million, and with all the DEA agents in Bolivia and in the Southern Cone, with all our informants telling us that the fix is in, that Gutierrez is going to he get his bail dropped from $3 to $1 million and walk out of the United States and no one is going to touch him with us telling this to the DEA. It's exactly what happened. On a Sunday morning, I got a call from a deputy U.S. Marshal that said, Mr. Michael Green, that did the Suarez case, yeah? He says, as I'm standing here talking to you, Gutierrez is being released from jail. And I cannot get DEA in Miami to come out and follow him. Thank you. Hang up. Get on the phone with every DEA agent I know. Miami, the headquarters. And I'm finally told by a good friend of mine, Richie Suyano, Mike, I just work with you. They're sending me out on something else. Why don't you just back off? I had no choice. So now the biggest case in history, and all of that press, had no defendants. No defendants, but you weren't told that. They gone. They walked out of this country free. The drug war, the American highly wanted U.S. war against drugs, was a joke. Where in South America, where the town the drug dealers were laughing. But the end of the injury was ever better. Casa, uh, Gutierrez, Roberto Suarez. Then in July 17, 1980, with the help of Klaus Barbie, neo Nazis, overthrow the the. Democratically elected government of Bolivia. And for the first time in our history, a drug cartel was running a country and they were the people that we arrested. But what I found out was, and again, I put the documented, they did it with the CIA support. How else did Gassi get out of jail? What happened then is history. 
If you look at any statistical curve of our drug problem, you'll see it began in the 1980s, the cocaine explosion in the United States went on a solid upswing to where it is right now, beginning in 1980. I started to complain. As evidence started to come in, I started to find the CIA's prints on everything that was happening, on the drug dealers being released, on the support of the neo-Nazis, on the support of people who were claiming to overthrow the government, on protecting these people, getting them out of jail. As I started to see these things happen, I started to complain, which was a mistake, not do that. It finally got so bad, when I could get no action out of my own government, it finally got so bad that I sent a letter to Newsweek magazine, return receipt requested. Because Newsweek magazine, uh, Larry Roder and Stephen Schatz, the two investigative reporters, had done a piece hinting that there might be CIA involvement in, in uh, South American drugs, or in drugs around the world. Well, on U.S. Embassy stationery, I said, this is going to sound like an unusual letter, but I'm the man who did the Roberto Suarez case, and if you guys really want a story, why don't you check on the release of Jose Roberto Castro? Why don't you check on I went down a series of things. I got my card back that this book, this letter, had been delivered to the New York Magazine. You're going to see photocopies of this card in the next book. I got no answer. Two months later, I was mysteriously put under investigation by my own agents. I was falsely accused of black marketing, of having sex with uh, female informants, female agents, of, this is female, huh? they, of, uh, they actually wrote me up for playing my radio too loud in the American Embassy playing rock music too loud in the American Embassy, disturbing other people, but not knowing where the CIA office was. I, was, I have all of this in writing. They, there was no lens that they wouldn't go to. They revoked my diplomatic status, they transferred me out of Argentina, uh, sent me to a desk job in, in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., what they did, promptly did, with, under investigation, my phone tap, the Federal Security Division following me, day and night, for what? Next thing I'm, I know, I'm offered a chance to work undercover in a thing called Operation Hunt, which targeted the same people I had been working on. This is, again, the subject of the next book, Queen of Cocaine, where it's just an escape headquarters. By this time, we found out that my daughter was on drugs. So I found myself in a strange position. Working undercover, deep cover assignment in Tucson, Arizona, living in a house with drug dealers. My daughter on drugs in New York, and I'm under investigation by DEA at the same time. And all I could do is just stay sane. I just said, God, let me through this period. Let me keep my life. Let me just keep this job until I can find something else. And I'm not going to talk to anybody. And you know what? I probably would have done exactly that. A couple of years later, we would have gone yes again. We were undercover on a thing called Operation Trifecta. Operation Trifecta was a deep cover pull into the top of the drug world in Mexico, Panama, and Bolivia. It was 1987. And in all three countries, it successfully penetrated. In all three countries, the wrong government killed the case. And that's when I wrote the cover. Of course, it did nothing. It has to date no effect on anything. Uh, the book was a bestseller, which it really didn't matter to me. I wrote it, but I never intended to write a book. Uh, when, when the case started to go awry, I wrote a memo to my own government and said, this is what you've done. This is my experience. This whole drug war is a fraud. Are you going to investigate yourself? That memo was hidden, and that's when the book was written. This is your drug war. You've got, out of the north, 
man was an American hero. Men bent over backwards trying to get some of the biggest drug dealers that were arrested out of jail. He's been banned from Costa Rica by a Nobel Prize winning president for a drug run. Gun run in our country is not even investigated. He is banned along with Tony Dexter, the head of national security, the ex, the ex ambassador to Costa Rica, banned for drug running in our country is not investigated. A DEA agent in Honduras documented 50 tons of cocaine coming into this 